Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about the um, uh, update on diagnosis and management of Kawasaki disease, a scientific statement from the American Heart Association. My name is Penny Joan. I'm a professor of pediatric director of the Echo Lab at Lurie Children's Hospital and affiliated with Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. My co-author here is Audrey Tremolay. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Tremolay, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego. And um, I'm also the Associate Director of our Kawasaki Disease Research Center and a Pediatric Infectious Disease Physician at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Um, we would like to thank the AHA for commissioning this statement. Um, and so we're going to take you um, through an understanding of why this statement and some key points. Penny, if you could lead us off. So since 2017 statement, uh, there's been quite a bit of a development in the management and diagnosis of Kawasaki disease and the long-term follow-up of Kawasaki disease patients. So therefore, we uh, were updating this document from the 2017 statement. And what do you think are the new key points of this paper from a diagnostic standpoint, Audrey? So from diagnosis, I mean, the the uh, Kawasaki disease remains a clinical diagnosis with pathognomonic uh, findings. But I think it's really important for people to know um, that it, you don't have to wait for five days. Um, certainly with the presence of at least four clinical features, um, the diagnosis of complete KD can be made with four days of fever. That's one of the changes that we're making. It's also important to know that the diagnostic criteria for incomplete KD are unchanged um, from the 2017 statement, but we do continue to advocate for people to think about this diagnosis, um, especially in the young infant um, with the week of fever, still um, having an echo for that child is really important. Um, the real important thing, of course, continues to be early detection to prevent coronary artery dilation and aneurysms, and it does continue to remain difficult to identify KD in some children, um, but it's there is substantial data that um, having dilation of the coronary arteries with a Z-score equal to or greater than 2.5 at the time of diagnosis of either the right coronary artery or the left anterior descending coronary artery, or being less than six months of age are really high risk features um, for Kawasaki disease and for having coronary artery abnormalities. Penny, can you um, share with us a little bit of what's changed in terms of the echocardiogram? So the echo remains the primary non-invasive imaging for assessment of coronary artery dilations and accurate measurements of the coronary artery is critical in risk stratifying these Kawasaki patients in addition to determining treatment. It is important for the centers to use the same Z-score for comparison over time so that there is no differences in the dif different Z-scores. For example, if you're using the uh, Boston Z-score, we would not recommend that the patient is switched over to the PHN Z-score because inherently there are different Z-score systems. In this statement, we will outline the differences in the different Z-scores among the different population. And in the statement, we also recommend the use of same Z-scores. In addition, obtaining height and weight is important so that we can prevent over and underestimation of coronary artery Z-scores. Now, the advantage of using Z-scores is important from an epidemiology perspective, but it it is also important to acknowledge that Z-score alone cannot determine the nature of injury to the coronary arteries. So as Audrey had defined the high-risk patients in our paper, we said that patients actually less than 12 months of age are high risk in one of the populations. However, many publications have indicated the high risk population are less than six months of age and a coronary artery Z score of the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery Z score of greater than 2.5 at diagnosis are considered high risk population. So Audrey, can you tell us about the update in the treatment for these high risk population? Yeah, it's um, really become standard um, 
to have intensification of primary therapy with adjunctive anti-inflammatory therapy, so dual therapy in this group that you've outlined, right? So these young infants and children that have an abnormal echo from the very beginning. So the recommendation is to have IVIG plus a second agent. And there are multiple agents that are available. The most standard ones are to use either steroids or infliximab. And there has not yet been a head-to-head -head comparison as to which is better. But we know that in studies that have been done comparing dual therapy from the beginning in children with abnormal coronaries, they do fare better over time than those that are treated with IVIG alone. So that dual therapy is really important. The other thing um, that we're emphasizing in the statement is that there has been um, some updates in what's available for children that um, need anticoagulation. So traditionally, it's been warfarin and low molecular weight heparin, but there has been some initial studies um, showing safety in children with the need for long-term anticoagulation with the direct oral anticoagulants. And so there's more study to be done in that area, but I think those require, the DOACs require less therapeutic monitoring, um, can certainly be easier to administer than the injections from low molecular weight heparin and don't have the dietary restrictions that something like warfarin would have. So I think that's a real new advantage for our families and our, and our children. There's also some outlines that we've done in terms of the treatment of um, myocardial infarction in those rare cases where that happens. So Penny, if you could just highlight some of the MI management for our listeners. Yeah, so in our paper, we have a very nice figure that talks about the management of MI patients. The risk of myocardial infarction in Kava's occupation with giant aneurysms is highest is actually in the first two to three months after KD onset. Acute coronary symptoms may present differently in our KD population compared to the classical presentation of MI in adults. All medical centers who follow KD patient with giant aneurysm need to have a multidisciplinary heart team and a protocol in place to address these major adverse cardiac events. In this paper, we also have documented on different risk criteria of coronary artery patient, how they are managed in terms of echo in the hospital setting. We have done that for the acute phase, and that is shown in this figure. And we also have done another table that talks about long-term management of imaging for the Kawasaki patients. So Audrey, if you can go through with us the long-term management surveillance of these patients. For patients who have coronary artery abnormalities, long-term surveillance is really important, especially in any child that has a large or a giant aneurysm one year after KD onset. This could be performed with a low radiation CT, for example. There's been advances in MRI imaging, or even in those rare cases where invasive angiography may be needed depending on the coronary complexity and also any clinical symptoms that the patient may be having. Of course, that's also dependent on what's available at your own institution as well. There have been uh, a number of advancements in coronary CT angiography with less radiation. Um, so when that's available, it can be used to understand the anatomy at baseline for following these patients over time and to identify any coronary artery stenoses that may happen. The other area that's really advanced as well has been in CMR coronary in imaging, which has really been able to evaluate our patients without the need for radiation. So MR in that case is better for myocardial functional analyses, really in addition to stress perfusion imaging as the modality for inducible ischemia. So we do have technologies that have developed that are much better for following our patients. There's also room for stress echo, and that can be used to evaluate KD patients with coronary artery abnormalities for inducible ischemia. Of course, that tends to sometimes, depending on your institution, may just be an older age group that it can be done in, but definitely there's advantages to that as well for following patients long-term. And finally, invasive coronary angiography provides the finest delineation of the coronary architecture but its use really needs to be balanced against the risks of an invasive procedure based upon the patient, the institutional factors, really is that warranted, especially given some of the newer technologies that we currently had. But it's still, of course, what's used for children that are having myocardial ischemia that would benefit from having revascularization. 
So stress echocardiography can also be used to evaluate KD patients with coronary artery abnormalities for inducible ischemia. It's also important to know that invasive coronary angiography provides the finest delineation of the coronary architecture, although this really needs to be balanced against the risks of this invasive procedure based upon the patient and institutional factors. So it is used for patients with myocardial ischemia and intervention for revascularization. This uh, uh, statement is also emphasizing the importance of transition of care, which I think we really can't overemphasize. Um, it's important if you're gonna be caring for KD patients to know that you have a medical team that can care for your Kawasaki patient during not only their acute phase, but also long-term, and then how to hand them off for those of us in the pediatric world to, um, to their adult healthcare provider. So that requires knowing who will follow up your patients. That's traditionally a cardiologist in your community um, and creating that relationship and that interest in understanding the long-term care of our KD patients. But it also requires needing to educate our patients about their own disease. And for our teenagers that we're discharging from our care, for them to know why they may be on certain medications, why they need to be on particular um, have particular follow-up. And um, we actually create a medical summary for our patients that I would recommend different institutions do. And then you have the patient take a picture of it and they will always have their phone with them. So they will have their medical summary in case of some medical emergency with them. So there's a lot that's been updated, but I, I do think it's important also for us to um, highlight some future directions. So Penny, if you could take us to understand some future directions that we've highlighted as well. Thanks, Audrey. So despite many advances, we still have a lot of knowledge gap in terms of the ideology of Kawasaki disease. We really need a diagnostic testing te uh, test to identify Kawasaki patients from other illnesses. We also need acute additional therapies on which one to use as the first line for our patients. And there continues to be long-term management criteria that we need to define for our patients. Risk scores for, for both IVIG resistance and development of coronary artery aneurysms have been developed in diverse populations and may improve outcomes for allowing targeted adjunctive therapy in high-risk patients. Iterative improvements in diagnostic testing and algorithms include potential incorporation of artificial intelligence. Randomized trials are directly comparing acute intensification with anti-inflammatory agents in high-risk patients could lead to lower CAA incidence and less progression of coronary artery aneurysms in patients with Kawasaki disease at the time of diagnosis. So we like to conclude by thanking our writing uh, partners and committees on this paper. And thank you very much, Audrey, for joining me to talk about this statement. Thank you, Penny, for this opportunity. We hope that it's a useful document for everyone to take better care of our KD patients. Thanks to the AHA for this opportunity as well.